Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the, uh, the the third presentation, the second to last presentation of the first day of our CentOS Dojo. Um, in this presentation, Carl George and Troy Dawson uh, will be presenting about the state of Apple. So, Carl and, jo and excuse me, Carl and Troy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as introduced, I'm Troy Dawson. This is Carl. Uh, we're Howdy both you. on the we're both on the Apple Steering Committee, and just so warming up, we're going to do a little stats before we get into any real news. Oop, let's make sure we can change slides. There we go. Um, for those of you have, who haven't seen these before, we have two different style of stats. Those that are just connect, counting unique IP addresses, and those that are using the smarter, and I always forget the name, Carl, what is the, what's the new thing called? Count me. Count me, the smarter count me. Don't know why it doesn't stick in my head. Uh, this not a first cool name like Velociraptorizer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. So Velociraptorizer is using the unique IP addresses, which is not as accurate, but it also gets the the Apple five, six, and seven numbers, which we cannot get with the count me. Yes, count me is so, only available in DNF in Apple eight in Apple nine, or EL eight and EL nine. So using the unique IP addresses, it's sort of fun to see. We're over 5 million users. Uh, we did have a little peak there at the beginning of the year, and then it went, went down. Actually, that's around November. If we break those out a little bit more into their things, we see that it's actually Apple 7 that's the big one, 3,500,000. Um, from what I've been told, we believe this is when Amazon uh, switched their Amazon Linux over to be EL7 based. That's what that big jump is there. Uh, Rail 6, it's starting to go down finally. Uh, a little bit, but there's still quite a few people. Uh, CentOS 8 or has finally passed it. And I had to write this one in, Carl, because it was just so small <laughs> that you couldn't see it. Uh, Apple 9 has 1,386. This is by unique IP addresses. Um, why did I do this one? Oh, because this wasn't in any other graph, so I, I did this one. So using the count me, I'm going to switch back to the one before. We see that EL8 by I, unique IP addresses hasn't even made it to a million. But if we switch to the count me, we'll see that it's over 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. uh, since I know you're going to go over these other things, so I'm just going to say at this point that we're at 1.5 million for, for Apple 8. Yeah, the new count, count me system works a lot better because um, we had the oh. undercounting problem with NAT before with the IP address style where, you know, I mean, how many of us have, you know, three or four different systems consuming Apple in our house, if not more, and they're all behind one IP address. So that's fairly common, I think, which is why I think that we see a lot higher number here. Yep. And I'm going to turn it over to you. These are yours. Tell me when to switch. Sure. Slides. I owe Matthew some uh, integration with his, uh, his tool set with all the dinosaur names and stuff. But uh, until I get more free time to do that, then uh, I've got just a hacky little script that's Pulling from the same data source, uh, we can link that at some point in the chat. Uh, it's an open, open, uh, open database. Basically, there's a CSV file and an SQLite file. Anyone can go through and tinker with these and uh, generate their own uh, charts. These ones I made with uh, Matplotlib, uh, which I'm not an ex I'm not a data scientist, so I kind of stumbled my way through it. Um, here's one that I thought was interesting. Uh, we're already up over a thousand uh, for this past week. Over a thousand uh, Stream Nine systems hitting Apple Nine, and there's a good chunk of uh, Rel Nine. Those are probably Rel Nine beta systems. Um, it could even be systems that are further ahead than that from internal internal Red Hat systems. And um, yeah, that's not, nothing much to say show there, but it is uh, it is interesting to see the growth in real time. We can go on to the next slide. 
So um, here is here is Apple eight. So for Apple nine, I put everything on one chart just because there's really only two consumers of that right now: Stream nine and Rail nine. For for eight, obviously, there's a lot more different, a lot more diversity uh, spread across. One thing that we kept noticing in previous versions of this talk is that uh, CentOS Linux eight just kept growing, and uh, in this very last week, it looks like it's leveled off. But it's you know it's leveled off and dipped before, then started growing again. So uh, it's still yet to be determined if um, if that'll actually start dipping as people m migrate off of an EOL distro to one to one of the alternatives. Uh, we can see some of the newer some of the other d options here that people need to be migrating to. Um, they're broken out a little bit better in the next chart, except for Rel. Uh, Rel kind of fits in between. These next couple of slides are all Apple eight. But I did them over, broken out into um, into kind of different buckets just because of the ranges that they're in, so they don't stomp on each other too much where you can't see anything. Another notable thing is that all of these charts are for systems that are older than one week old. <clears throat> that that is part of the uh, reporting in DNF Count Me. They get put in age buckets. Uh, it doesn't track the exact age. It just says the system's less than a week, and then I forget the exact intervals. But there's other buckets like say a month or six months. I don't remember the exact ones. Smooch will probably correct me in the, in the chat. <laughs> he, he's an easy expert at this, I think. But yes, we, I, we, we felt I have, a, Go ahead. I have a slide at the end of yours that actually shows the weeks. Nice. Just so we can see, see that. Yeah. Some more details on that, but yes, uh, the main reason we filter out the ones that are less than a week old is primarily to take container and CI systems out of the stats. While that is still usage, uh, I think mo most people are more interested in, um, ongoing systems that are installed and still running consuming Apple. So moving on to the next slide, we can see here that uh, all of these new alternatives, everything's growing. Uh, CentOS Stream 8 still going strong, as are the new rail rebuilds. Um, Oracle Linux doesn't seem to have as much of a growth trend, but it is still growing as well. Um, and Cloud Linux, which isn't exactly a uh, rail clone, but it is mostly rail compatible from what I'm told. Uh, it has a little bit flatter trajectory, but in the next, it is also represented in the next graph, I think. Um, so you can see how it compares to some of these smaller options. Yeah, and that 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 black line there, that's the same line. It's just on a different scale. So you can see why breaking these out into different uh, buckets of systems is necessary. So everything's just not flattened out so far where you can't see anything. Um, and yeah, Cloud Linux kind of sits in the middle here in the 4,000 range currently. And uh, a lot of other systems are well under a thousand. So if we go on to the last slide of these, uh, wow. here is, uh, yeah, one that I noticed that jumped out at me was Miracle Linux, which I don't know much about. It looks to be a Japanese uh, rail clone. It seems to be getting a lot more popular in the eight series. It looks, I looked up a little bit more about it and it seems like it existed beforehand as well. Um, it's existed for a long time, but we only have the information, the per OS breakout for systems with count me, which is EL8 and, and up. Um, another interesting one in here that we've talked about here before was SUS Liberty Linux, which it's only a little blip there. It was a lot higher uh, for, there were systems that were less than a week old that aren't getting shown here, uh, but that has since got, dropped down to zero and is not shown up anymore. Uh, that was in the news a little bit. And from what we can tell publicly, uh, from what a few SUS engineers have said, is that um, there was at some point something resembling a distro reporting itself as SUS Liberty Linux. And that's what we saw in these, these notes. But that is not what they announced SUS Liberty as. Uh, SUS Liberty Linux is a rebrand and rescope of their support offering where you can stop paying Red Hat and pay SUSE instead to get patches for rel boxes. And they added CentOS systems to that as well. So um, I guess they shifted their strategy and those systems don't report themselves as SUSE Liberty anymore, um, which that wouldn't even make sense if you're trying to do a compatible distro to change you know, the OS release file. That would probably break a lot of things and assumptions for third-party software. So uh, that is no longer in the charts. And I guess, uh, I guess it's not a distro is what they're saying now despite the earlier signs. Yeah, that sounded like a bit of a PR, I won't <laughs> say nightmare, but not fun. You ready for the next one? Yep, let's go. Oh, there we are. This is the chart that I told you. So the these light blue on the bottom, those are 
things that only live for one week. Um, like Carl said, uh, we, we believe they're, you know, containers, test things, CI things. Then the next breakout is two to four weeks. Uh, I always, now that one's sort of stable. Actually, both of them are sort of stable, about 50%. I always picture the two to four weeks because there is some groups that wipe their machine monthly. They don't do an update. They just do a fresh install, which you can do now with um, something that starts with an A. You know, whenever I'm in front of the camera, all words just go out of my head. <laughs> um, but it, it's neat to see the 25-week the one continuing to grow. Those are our long timers. So, And these are just EL8 and EL9 systems, correct? Since it's correct. count me data? Correct. Although I doubt there's any EL9s in the long time machine. But, uh, I mean, okay, so if you remember last time I had a lot of these boxy charts. This is the only one I've got. This is how arches are broken up. So RHEL has, well, RHEL 8 and 9 it has XA664, which is Intel and AMD, Arch64, which is the ARM stuff. And then here, other is PowerPC64 and S390X, which is S390X are basically mainframes, and PowerPC64 is, I don't know. I, I've, nowadays, I've only seen them as desktops. But anyway, um, so just so you know, most of our stuff is still uh, Intel-based, Intel AMD, but ARM is, is growing. And I think that's it for, for graphs. Let's get this. on to the real news. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to give this one to you. Sure. So people that have seen this talk before, here's what's different since the last time. We have launched Apple 9. Um, and for the first time ev ever, Apple 9, an Apple version has launched before the corresponding rail version. Um, this wasn't our original plan. What we talked about previously, which we'll get into... Uh, We'll get into what Apple Next is in another slide, but we'd originally talked about doing Apple Next, which is sort of a, um, it's a different build target that builds off of CentOS Stream 9 instead of RHEL 9. We were going to launch that by itself and let people start building their packages there and getting them ready, and then do a mass rebuild from that into Apple 9 after the RHEL 9 launch. Um, that was the simplest thing from an implementation perspective, but as, as we were going around trying to explain that to people and how you know, for these, you know, you know, roughly six months, you need to target Apple 9 next. And then after that, you need to target Apple 9 unless you have one of these conditions. And then you go back to Apple 9 next. It just, it was too messy to explain and document. So we, we went, went with a shift in strategy. And instead, we stood up Apple 9 just from the get-go. It currently builds against CentOS Stream 9, which works just fine because RHEL 9 hasn't launched yet. After RHEL 9 launches... Uh, we are going to switch the Apple 9 build route to build against RHEL 9. Those packages should still all keep working. Uh, what we've seen so far is that packages that have been built against CentOS Stream 9 install and work just fine on RHEL 9 beta. Um, and things are going really well. The uh, There's a lot of growth. Uh, pulled some recent stats this morning for this. Uh, Apple 9 already has uh, 3,300 uh, 3, binary packages, uh, over 1,600 source packages, and then uh, there's been over 1,300 total Bodhi updates submitted so far. Um, that doesn't correspond directly to the number of packages because that includes, you know, uh, uh, subsequent updates that people have issued. But it's growing really well. And um, I know that whenever we first launched it, there were, I saw a lot of complaints about, oh, how could you launch this? It's not ready yet. The, the package I care about isn't ready. How did you not consider my needs? And, you know, we just kept reiterating to people that Apple is not a specific content set packages don't apple packages don't get branched from don't automatically go from say apple 8 to apple 9 it's a new repo every time that starts from scratch for better or worse and there's reasons we do that um having to maintain packages for you know a decade is not really something that volunteers always want to do and we don't want to assume that they will um so that's that's why every time there's a new apple version it is an opt in from the maintainer that yes they do want to keep they want, do want to sign up for potentially another 10 years of maintenance on that package. 
We do have an, an escape hatch, though. Uh, by policy, Apple packages can be retired at any time. Uh, it's not like Fedora, where in Fedora, you're only allowed to retire packages out of uh, Rawhide, I believe. Once they're in a stable release, they should be maintained for, uh, you know, I think it's 13 months after that point. So we allow Apple packages to be retired earlier, but um, obviously we'd like them to stick around so they get used and uh, are available for people. Do you, yeah. Anything one, else about Apple 9, Troy? Well, I was going to comment on what, what you were saying before. Uh, one of the things for Apple, we, we try to make it stable. So you don't necessarily have to go to the latest thing. If you have a Ruby thing that's still working on Apple 7, it doesn't mean you have to retire it just because it's old. But when there is security updates, that's when you really need to and you can't backport them to that. That's when you need to think about that. For Apple 9, uh, I'm just excited about it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the KDE a little bit later. That's what I've been mainly working on. it, And I have a few more stats a little bit later in the slides. Yeah. How about we move on to Apple 8? Well, I'll, one more quick oh. thing. The uh, the okay. other big, pos the big positive of this is that um, it's going to keep growing. And the idea is that by the time Rail 9 launches, we should have a very large collection of packages. Um, at the current rate, I think it'll surpass Apple 8 before Rail 9 launches, which is really exciting. Uh, I know a lot of the complaints that we've heard uh, from people migrating, people that would potentially be migrating from EL7 to EL8 is that um, the packages that they need aren't available. And even, even Rail customers, they know that those packages are unsupported and they can't file support cases for them but they don't care. They just need that package to be available and installable. And so um, the we've had a little bit of a lack of growth in Apple 8. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, Modularity is complicated and also um, missing development packages have been a real big pain point. But um, I think because of that, the bar is set pretty low with Apple 8 for Apple 9 to surpass it. <laughs> that <laughs> is it, true. To put it as mildly as I can, I guess. Okay, I think that is a good segue to Apple 8. Yes. I'm going to, wow, that slide doesn't really change much, but it does say 8 now. Um, I'm going to say the one thing I have about Apple 8. Um, so when Apple 8 started, we tried something called Apple 8 Playground. Uh, it was a place for people to try new things. Um, it was a little bit like Rawhide. And it acted a little bit like Rawhide because your packages automatically came in. Then never really panned out. Um, and over the years, nowadays, it's become more of a burden, or it was more of a burden. And uh, Apple 8 Playground is no more. As of this week, uh, we have decommissioned it. There's no longer a target in, target in Koji. Uh, we have taken out all those package config files. Uh, if I miss one or two, please take it out yourself. Um, but I, I tried really hard to find them all. We've uh, made the dead package, which is retiring all of the Apple 8 playground branches. Again, I'm pretty sure I got them all, but it's possible I missed one or two. Go ahead and take them out. Um, so with this, we're going to say Adios Playground, it was nice, but you didn't pan out. And Carl, I can't remember what's on the notes. What else do we have for sure. Apple 8? Uh, let's see. Uh, we've talked about the play, you just talked about the playground stuff. Um, I mentioned earlier that Apple, the growth of Apple 8 initially was kind of hindered, not just for modularity, but missing devil packages. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone that's done uh, Apple packaging for 8 has probably run into this and seen it. Um, this is a result of some real product decisions where they want to ship a smaller content set to reduce what uh, support cases get filed. Um, personal opinion, I think that's kind of uh, kind of backfired because now we just have all of these support cases. Um, customers saying, "I need this package. Why won't you provide it?" So I think it's probably a wash, but you know, I'm, I don't have exact numbers on that, and I'm. Not, you know, I don't work in support, so who knows? Maybe it is a big relief. But either way, not everything. Uh, I guess the kind way to put it would be that we're trying to be intentional with what's shipped in RHEL. And so 
until there's demand shown of I need food devil that might not be in there. And then we've set up uh, a standard practice process now where you can, if you do need that, especially for an Apple package as a build requirement, you can file a bugzilla and probably get it included into uh, the code ready builder repository, which also known as power tools in CentOS eight and stream eight. So let me just iterate a little bit. We are, we have the, the red hat and Apple thing a little later, but uh, there was a policy change within red hat. Initially, every time people asked for these develop packages, the default answer was no. And they had to have a very strong case uh, for it. They've switched that to now it's the maintainer's uh, choice. So uh, I'm filing one today that there's, what, what driver is this? I just found a, a missing one. Xorg X11 DRV EVDV. Uh, How did you not remember missing, that name by memory? <laughs> <how did> I, <laughs> yeah. It's missing in Devel, and I need that for Plasma Desktop. Uh, and I just found that out today. Um, but so when I I file the, the thing, it is up to that the maintainer of that package to determine whether he thinks he can support it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and there is some developers that legitimately do not want to support it. They've said it, but for my part, over 75%, maybe even 80% have said, Oh yeah. And they've, they put it in both Apple eight and Apple nine. So anyway, it was an internal policy change that has allowed us to get these develop packages in in uh, CRB and power tools. Yeah, I, th I think Relate's in a lot better place now as far as uh, providing what Apple 8 needs, but Apple 8 is still just lagging from uh, not having that stuff to start with and either maintainers getting disinterested or frustrated and uh, just haven't checked again to see that the thing they need. Um, I know some, some people have even told me, I've suggested, you know, here's how you get that added. You know, you just file this bugzilla I've had people tell me they literally cannot be bothered to file a bugzilla. And so I don't have a lot of sympathy for those people. Like this is open source. If you don't <laughs> tell us what we need to do uh, in places other than just, you know, yelling at us in an ephemeral channel, like social media or IRC, like get in the bug tracker, get in the official process. We, we want to make things better. Talk to us in the right places. Yep. So there, um, I the, think that's the steps. That. Yeah, I think it is. Are, are we ready for the next one? No, there's one more Apple 8 thing we wanted oh. to talk about, uh, the mock that? configurations. So, Oh, yeah. Historically, the mock tool, which is a, a tool to build uh, packages in a cheroot. So, for example, you could, on a Fedora system, you could build EL8 or EL7 pack compatible packages uh, from your Fedora system, or vice versa. You could be on a, a RHEL 8 system and build Fedora packages, all these different combinations. Um, that tool has typically used CentOS for the base operating system for the Apple Cheroots. Uh, we had a lively discussion around that and how to handle that going forward with the early end of life of CentOS 8. And uh, what we in, there was no good solution. There was just less bad solutions. Um, there are already mock configurations that allowed you to use actual RHEL, which is what Apple uses in the build system in Koji to build packages but that requires setting up a subscription. Um, those are available for free if you want to sign up for the real developer subscription up to 16 instances. And that that works with mock and you can just configure all that in the mock wiki. They have notes on how to do that, uh, but it is an extra step. Uh, other people suggested using one of the, you know, we were using a rebuild before and we should just switch to one of the new rebuilds. There was a lot of back and forth around, well, will this be seen as plain favorites? Um, this was a decision from mock upstream that, um, Employment status wasn't really a factor. It definitely wasn't a Red Hat decision. It was the upstream mock decision. Uh, but there was a lot of back and forth and discussion around this. And where we ended up settling on was just there will no be, be no default for an Apple 8 uh, configuration. The fact that we had Apple config, mock configurations with no, no description of the base operating system was basically looked at as a bug anyways. And so we fixed the bug. So now, now we have configurations like rel plus apple 8 or centos stream plus apple 8 or um any of the other ones like that so now you have to opt in explicitly to the one you want to do 
if you pick the rail one, then you have to set up that subscription stuff. Um, unless you, you know, work for Red Hat and reconfigure, reconfigure the def the configuration file to point to internal resources, but that's not available to everyone. The developer subscription is the best choice there to build against actual rel. Um, but it makes it more explicit now. And uh, Mock has even put in some some warnings to, or they're I don't remember if they've merged that yet, but they're working on some warnings to tell people when you tr when you call a, a, a configure Mock configuration that doesn't exist, at least for the Apple Eight one. It'll put out inform, print out information about this change and about what you need to do to resolve it. Yep. So this this configuration is also going to be on for Apple nine, but by nine time everybody should have figured out. Okay, this is my default, and usually I already have the link set up to to link to the default. Yeah. Yeah, the difference was that you know we'll just never make an uh, an Apple nine with no explicit base operating system. People can set up that sim link on their own if they want. I mean, you can create any name you want to for uh, for mock configurations and inherit from other mock configurations and things like that. But the mock core configs package is not going to ship and uh, unbranded isn't the right term, but like un um generic Apple nine configuration. We, we, they just won't ship that. Um, so right now the ones that are in there are CentOS Stream uh, plus Apple Nine. Um, in the future there'll be separate ones for Apple Next, which I think that's the next slide to talk about too. So I'll pause on that thought. Okay. Or segue with it, whatever works. Let's, if you have anything else for Apple Eight. I don't. Let's segue over. It sounds like a good segue. Sure. So Apple Next. Um, this is something we started last year that. Um, I don't remember. I think we launched it in June or July. One of the one of the J months. I don't remember which one. Uh, we launched Apple Eight Next, and what that is is that um, as a lot of people here are familiar um, familiar with by now, CentOS Stream isn't actually rolling in the common definition of the word. Even though we initially called it that, it has major versions and it has EOL dates, and it really just sits just immediately upstream of RHEL. It's very, very similar to RHEL. In fact, I was just talking with someone about this uh, yesterday and doing math, actually comparing RHEL 8 NVRs and CentOS Stream 8 NVRs, and only 5% of the of the packages, of the source packages, have a higher version. Um, another, Most of those are small version changes, like 121 to 122, very small compatible changes. Um, another 5% are higher version releases, which is, you know, the same, you know, the same version, but an addition, a release bump, which may be, um, maybe had to get rebuilt against the library change, or maybe just a new, new backported patch. Um, so, ninety percent of it is basically identical to RHEL, uh, especially for Apple consumption purposes. That doesn't justify having an entirely separate Apple repository for. Um, so, what we ended up doing was we started Apple Next, which is uh, different build targets and different repos but they layer on top of the standard Apple repositories. So on the way that work, the way that shakes out is if you have a rel8 system, you would add Apple eight. And if you have a CentOS stream eight system, you would add both Apple eight and Apple eight next. Um, so, most of the so package. Carl, go ahead. I'm surprised you can do that without using your hands. Whenever I describe it, I have to do it <laughs> this way. You start with Apple eight and then go for Apple eight next goes on top of it. <laughs> It isn't Apple eight next up by its own. It's it's always on top. Right. I mean, it's a it's a yum repo. You could add it by itself, but then packages from there won't probably install because most of their dependencies will come from Apple eight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what uh that's the way it's intended. Um, I'm actually not aware of any need for it at this exact moment in time. Before Rel eight five launched, there was a Qt rebase, I believe, uh, five twelve to five fifteen, if memory serves me correctly. Yes, that landed in CentOS Stream 8 first, as designed. Um, you know, five, four, five, six months—I don't remember exactly—until before RHEL 8.5 had the same change. Same change. Packages in Apple 8 that built against Qt had to be rebuilt against these new Qt libraries. Um, is mostly compatible, but just still required a rebuild for all the library SO names to line up correctly and all the dependencies to get to be made proper. So what Apple 8 Next allowed us to do was anything that build required and linked against Qt libraries in Apple 8 could be rebuilt in Apple 8 Next and then be compatible with CentOS Stream 8. 
systems that were just like rel 8 plus epil 8 that were just looking at epil 8 only didn't see this rebuild yet kept installing packages compatible with the older qt that they were still that they originally had uh stream 8 systems got the you know got the newer nvrs for those packages from epil 8 next and then once once rel 8 5 was released rel faced the same problem and we had already faced it in, in epil 8 next with, with stream 8 and knew what to do and just you know, I know Troy worked on most of that, um, rebuilt everything that was necessary and got uh, got everything shipped in a very short amount of time. Um, and at that point, those packages in Apple 8 Next ceased to be useful because compatible pack packages in Apple 8 were compatible with both Rel 8 and CentOS Stream 8. And of course, all the derivatives of Rel 8. So that's kind of the workflow that we envision for that. Um, it is a sometimes necessary repository We've already stood up Apple Nine next. Uh, right now, that is definitely not anything anyone needs to be using, just because uh, Apple Nine and Apple Nine Next are, are both building against CentOS Stream Nine. Uh, after the Rel Nine launch, that's whenever uh, Apple Nine Next will, at some point, be useful. It may, not, I don't know when if it'll be in nine point zero or nine point one, or but at some point, whenever something gets introduced into Stream Nine before it hits Rel Nine. Uh, Apple maintainers can use Apple Nine Next to get compatible packages and meet all the needs for all the consumers. Yeah, uh, for for me, for the KDE groups, uh, we know we're gonna at least for for Apple Eight, we're gonna have at least one more bump, and we're gonna build all those KDE things in Apple Eight Next and Apple Nine Next, so that when the next rel move comes over, that's usually when people update their desktops and stuff. Sorry, I, I keep getting into KDE, but that's my, my main work in Apple. Um, so that when, you know, 8.6 or 8.7, whatever it is, when they do the update to their uh, their desktop, we'll, we'll put that over onto Apple 8 from Apple 8 Next, and then they can just move it up from there. And if they want to get, get it early, they can always point at the Apple 8 next repo. I wouldn't wouldn't do that, but uh, some people can. So so it's a, it's also a way to stage something that you know you're gonna put over into the next major rel update. So you can you can build a little early and then bring it over at, at that time. You faced a little bit of that with the QT stuff, right? Like did, if I remember right, some of the packages actually had to be upgraded into newer versions to work with the oh. newer version of QT, right? Yes, and and also it, it's the the KDE SIG decided you know that's going to be our strategy going forward. Is uh, for KDE, you know what? I'm going to segue into this real quick. I had one follow up on that before you go. <laughs> okay. um, a good point since oh, we talked we about are. how we got rid of uh, Apple Playground. This oh, is very right. different from Apple Playground. Apple Playground still built against. Uh, rel and building something in apple playground didn't make it compatible with like a library change in CentOS stream uh everything that goes in apple 8 next and apple 9 next it's still bound by the rules of what type of upgrades are allowed in apple you can't just do major version upgrades because you feel like it uh, what troy's talking about kde actually has a special exception to do upgrades um within an and apple life cycle uh, i don't know if you want to talk about that go into more detail on that one on the kde slide but you st Apple Next still follows Apple policy is my main po point that I want to bring up. That is not that is correct. Th that is not Playground. You have to do a Bodhi update on Next. Playground just automatically sucked it in. Um, you have to do a Bodhi update because um, I have seen a couple of people go, hey, how come this package didn't go in? Well, because you didn't do a Bodhi update. So, yeah, it is not Playground. I think it was inspired by Playground. We knew at the Playground time, we knew, knew we needed something. Yeah, we had a few questions of how is that, when, whenever I first proposed Apple Next, had a few questions of how is this different from Playground and it's what it builds against. Uh, plus a different scope. With Playground, it was kind of no rules, do whatever you want to, play around with new major versions, and that's very much not what Apple Next is. That's correct. It's it. You do have to follow the rules. I can't remember what our next slide is. Mind if I change to it? Go for, go for it. I'm done now. That was my ah, thought. I had more numbers. I love numbers. 
<laughs> so one of the things that we're we're trying to do, we as in me, Carl, and probably most of the committee, is to get more uh, package maintainers into Apple. And to be honest, we haven't been counting. We're like, how do we count? Um, I got these numbers from uh, from Koji. Basically, do a Koji list latest and list all, and and it says who built it. So these numbers aren't exact, but they're pretty close. Because uh, sometimes, like let's say the Python sig, there might be five people that do it, but only one person that always builds it, so they don't show up. Um, and we, we found a pretty interesting correlation. So both Apple 7 and Apple 8, the, net, the amount of packages is equal to 10 times the amount of maintainers. Now, not every maintainer supports 10 packages. Uh, it's really one of those tail things. But it was a very interesting correlation. Um, also fun, fun thing to look at with this. Uh, is the the years, well, not years, the time. Uh, for Apple 7, we got 7,000 and took eight years to get there. Apple 8, we have 4,000 and took three years to get there. Apple 9, we have 1,600, and it's only been around for two months. Uh, so definitely a lot more interest in Apple 9. Uh, we're trying to keep that ball rolling. Um Part of why we, we, some of you might notice we're doing a lot more of these state of Apple is because I'm not going to say developers, 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 because that's not necessarily what we want. We want maintainers, maintainers, maintainers. Man, now, now I, I just feel so terrible saying something like that. <laughs> I, I'm, I am hopefully, other than the hairline, as far away from Balmer as can be. <laughs> One other quick follow-up. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the missing devil package problem uh, not being solved, per se, but being in a lot better state, having a way forward. Another big difference between uh, EL8 and EL9 is that um, the default versions for packages are entirely non-modular. Uh, modularity is still going to be in EL9, um, but it's going to be it's going to look a lot more like it does in Fedora, where it is optional alternative versions, and modularity works a lot better that way. Um, it certainly made standing up Apple Nine easier. Uh, we didn't have to. There's this tool called Grobby Splitter that we didn't have to didn't have to use that was necessary for eight with the uh, with the default module streams. So that was another thing that has made Apple Nine uh, the Apple Nine stand up a little bit easier and facilitated this rapid growth. Yep. I agree. I'm going to move on. We're starting to get a little bit yeah, we're close behind. Um, one thing that Carl and I, the Apple community, get asked all the time, how do I get my package in Apple? Or not necessarily my package, but a package in Apple. Why isn't this package in Apple? Yeah, we get that at least every day. <laughs> Once. I send this link out like twice a day. Twice a day. Yeah, um, we have instructions. Uh, we have we have it broken out for. Am I just a random person wanting to package an Apple? Am I a Fedora maintainer wanting to put it in Apple? Am I part of like the Apple uh, packaging? I've got this wrong. It was actually in the documentation wrong. Apple package sig. No packaging packager sig. Which one? Packager or SIG? I think that's I it. I put packaging. Yeah. I obviously got it wrong. The way but, I describe uh, people is it's kind of a choose your own adventure guide of uh, how to navigate getting a package into Apple. And it is very useful. Troy wrote the majority of it. Um, I think we've had a few pull requests tweaking wording here and there, but it is uh, it is awesome. Um, I, I appreciate you writing that, Troy. I'm sure a lot of other people oh. do as well. At some point when you answer the same question so many times, you just <laughs> got to document it. So um, because we're short on time, I don't want to go too much more. But this is so important, we actually put the URL on one of our slides. You might notice there's no other documentation on this that has the URL. That's the important one. Uh, I'm still putting this. People. 
I'm still putting this one up. So what's changed between uh, Apple and Red Hat, Carl? So uh, we've talked about this at previous slides, but um, when was it? I think October was whenever it started. But um, the big thing is that historically, Apple was kind of a side project. Um, me and Troy both work in the community platform engineering team. And for a long time, there was a, you know, a lot of push to have that be part of our the team's responsibilities. And uh, rightfully so, the CPE management pushed back on that and said, we'd love to do that with headcount. We're not just taking on additional work. Um, eventually that worked. And so uh, we, we got additional headcount approved. I was already in CPE, but I transferred over to be on that sub team, I guess would be the right term. Um, but we still had a net increase in headcount to backfill me working on CentOS Stream and other things like that. Um, we also have Diego on the team with me, who's also in the chat I saw. And uh, hopefully we can grow that team in the future. But we if we get to officially work on Apple as our, as our day job. Uh, another interesting side effect of that is that other members of CPE uh, feel a little more justified spending more time on Apple, even if it isn't their primary responsibility, because it is one of our official responsibilities for the wider team. Yeah, I can... I now no longer fear putting it on my status reports. So, Carl, this question I get asked all the time, does that mean that Red Hat is now supporting all the packages in Apple? Absolutely not. Support is a very tricky word. Um, and But you could, you could think of it like similar to how Red Hat supports Fedora with resources. Um, we just got the same arrangement for Apple, even though Apple's part of Fedora. But... Um, Red Hat is now officially putting resources into Apple, but individual Apple packages are still, like they always have been, completely unsupported. And if you file a support case, either asking about an Apple package or the end result is that an Apple package is causing some un unwanted side effect, uh, which is pretty rare because sh it should only be extra packages. But uh, if the end result is, hey, this is an Apple problem, the support case will be closed. It's not something for, uh, for Red Hat support to deal with. Yep. Um, but I'm so glad they did that. And it made standing up the Apple 9 and Apple Next, Apple 9, Apple 9 Next and Apple 9 yes. infrastructure so much, so much easier because we didn't have to wait for, for somebody to go, oh, I've got an hour here and I've got an hour here. We were able, you had dedicated people to set up. It was absolutely a huge factor in Apple 9 being able to launch before RHEL 9. You know, like we said before, something we've never been able to do before and hopefully something we can continue in the future. Yep. Alexandra put it really well in the chat. I see Apple is still a community project. It is not just some Red Hat product. It is not some Red Hat offering or it's not, and it's not only from Red Hatters. Um, a large portion of the packages in Apple are not maintained by Red Hatters. Um, and any Red Hatters you see participated in there in Apple, as far as packaging, we're participating there as community members, not as Red Hatters. Correct. We're getting a little short on time, so I'm going to go get through. We got two more things. Uh, Apple and KDE. Uh, we we plan on having KDE desktop ready for Apple nine. I wanted it done by now. But it will be done by GA, so you'll be able to have KDE on on Rail Nine or whatever clone you choose to do at launch. Um, KDE, as Carl said, is an exception because usually KDE, if you keep going, uh, you don't have to do it. It's compatible, so if if you keep maintaining at least once a year an update of KDE you don't actually have to change any configuration files and stuff. And you keep security updates. Uh, we were having problems with backporting security updates to like the old KDE and Apple 7. So KDE on Apple 8 and Apple 9 will continue to get a once a year update. Apple 8 will stop when, and we'll, we will, I guess the term is freeze that when rail 8 freezes, goes into maintenance mode. Uh, I don't want to take too much more time about KDE, but uh, that's what I like. <laughs> oh, we are at the end. 
just in time for questions and answers if if we have any also point out there is an apple packaging hack fest tomorrow and if uh, we have a whole bunch more questions I, i'm writing up an answer to one of them in the q a tab but uh, if you have more questions please show up to the apple packaging hack fest uh, the goal is to help fedora packagers get involved get involved with apple and learn about the processes um, some of them aren't familiar with requesting different branches which it works the same as requesting a branch in fedora but some wow. people never have to do that they just get their package in rawhide and let it get automatically branched so uh, but if you have other any other questions related to Apple, uh, feel free to show up there and uh, and ask away. So, Carl, I just looked in the questions and answers, and this was actually something we forgot to address. Yes. Um, the question uh, you say, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it out. You sure. say Apple nine builds against Central Stream nine. Is it likely Central Stream nine switches to nine point one before the nine GA release? So no. Uh, well, we're, we're aware of that um, because people have been looking closely at, in, at stream have probably noticed that um, it starts getting the content for the next release a little bit before the current minor release comes out. Um, it's hard to describe without exact numbers, but um, our plan is to basically freeze. Uh, CentOS Stream 9 gets mirrored into Fedora infrastructure for the builds. Uh, it doesn't download the packages from the mirror network every time. It Basically, Fedora Infra has its own mirror. And before any 9.1 content shows up in Stream 9, we're going to freeze that mirror. Um, it should for, only be for a short amount of time um, before actual Rail 9 launches, and we can put and we can make Apple 9 build against, uh, yeah, Apple 9 build against Rail 9. Um, can't really discuss exactly how long that is. That gets into Rail timelines and things like that that I'm not supposed to talk about. But we're aware, and we have a plan to a mitigating plan, and it should just. The idea is that it'll just work smoothly and no one will notice a thing. You just keep building Apple 9 packages, and at some point they go from building against Stream 9, reflecting 9.0 content, to building against Rel 9.0, and you're none the wiser. Thank you. And, yeah, I meant to bring that up in, at Apple 9. but So thank you for asking that. Uh, yes, I don't see question. any other questions. Is there any in the chat? The link to up packaging hackfest. Okay, that one's already been answered. Huh. Great. Well, that's that's fewer questions than than I expected, but that's fine. It's either a good or a bad thing. We either did a good job, <laughs> or people are bored. I think you covered everything thoroughly. Yep. Um, we will have these slides, just like all the others, uh, available. At the end, we do have links to everything, including the missing develop packages. I am working on rewriting this because it, that's the other question I get asked at least once a week. Um, but anyway, these, these slides with those links will be wherever they go with, with these dojos. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Carl. Um, just to reiterate, as, as Carl said, there's the Apple Packaging Hack Fest tomorrow. Uh, that's at 1900 UTC. It's the it's the last slot of the day, so um, you can just keep Carl on all day long um, asking him questions, and I don't have to boot you out. So uh, we've got our, our last talk of today will be in, uh, in 11 minutes, so uh, take a break or join in the hallway track, and uh, we'll see you back for the the last talk in 11 minutes. Thanks, Thanks for coming, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye.